Hi, today's lesson is on quadrilaterals and polygons. What are polygons? Well, we are familiar with some polygons like the triangle and the square. So, polygon is a many sided figure. For instance, this is a polygon. It's made up of straight lines that are joined together to complete the shape. Where the points meet are called the vertices of the polygon. So, this is a vertex. And the lines are called the sides of the polygon. This polygon, as we can see, has six sides and six vertices. Polygons are of course classified by their sides and their vertices. So a three-sided polygon we know is called a triangle. Any four-sided polygon is called a quadrilateral. A five-sided polygon is called a pentagon. A six-sided polygon is called a hexagon. An eight-sided polygon is called an octagon. A 10-sided polygon is called a decagon and so on. Let's start with quadrilaterals. Convex and concave quadrilaterals. So what is a convex quadrilateral? Well, most of the quadrilaterals we study are convex. Let's look at a typical quadrilateral and look at each of its angles. You notice that all these angles are less than 180 degrees. When you look at this quadrilateral, this angle is more than 180. So a convex figure is one in which every interior angle is less than 180 degrees. And a concave figure is one in which at least one interior angle is more than 180 degrees. And you can see that 180 degrees pretty much changes the shape of the figure. In this case, there is an inward pointing vertex, while in the convex case, all the vertices are outward pointing. Angles in the quadrilateral. So we know that a quadrilateral is a four sided figure, so it has four vertices and it has four angles. Let's try to figure out something that is common to all quadrilaterals. So I'll take a random quadrilateral. There are no particular conditions on the sides of the angles and I'll divide this quadrilateral by its diagonal into two triangles. So the angles of this triangle add up to 180 degrees and the angles of this triangle also add up to 180 degrees. If I add the angles of both triangles, I'll actually get the sum of the angles of the quadrilateral. So the sum of the angles is equal to 360 degrees and this can be done for any convex quadrilateral. So the sum of the angles of a quadrilateral is 360 degrees. The simple proof is divided by a diagonal into two triangles. Let's study the most basic quadrilaterals we know, squares and rectangles. Equiangular. What does equiangular mean? It means all the angles are equal. So both squares and rectangles are equiangular. A square, as you know, has equal sides and equal angles. Each angle is therefore 90 degrees. A rectangle also has each angle 90 degrees. So squares and angles are both equiangular quadrilaterals. Equilateral. Equilateral means all the sides are equal. So we know the square has all four sides equal, but a rectangle doesn't. So the fundamental difference between squares and rectangles is that in a square, all four sides must be equal. In a rectangle, it needn't be. It could be, of course. In which case that rectangle becomes a square. So the important thing here to note is that the set of rectangles contains the set of squares. Squares are those special rectangles which are also equilateral or 
which also have all four sides equal. The area of a rectangle is 14 meters square. Find the area of a square. Well, everyone knows the formula for the area of a rectangle. The area of a rectangle is given by length times width. In this case, the length is x plus 3 and the width is x minus 3. So, its area is x plus 3 into x minus 3. And that's given to be 14. Now, pause a minute. One way to solve for x. Why do I need x? I need x because to find the area of the square, if I found x, I'd be done. The area of the square is x square. Am I really looking for x? No. The question I'm asked is find the area of the square. So I'm looking for x square. Well, you'd argue that how can you find x square without x? Let's see. So x plus 3 into x minus 3, when I expand it, I get x square minus 9. It's of the form a plus b into a minus b, which is equal to a square minus b square. So, x square minus 9 is equal to 14. And one way to do this is to solve the quadratic, find the two roots of this quadratic. Those are the two values of x. One of them probably will get rejected and the other one will work. But watch this. They are asking for x square and I get x square directly. I get x square is 14 plus 9 equal to 23. And I'm done. The answer is 23. So you see, I didn't need to solve the quadratic because x squared dropped out right in the beginning. So always be careful of what they're asking and you'll save time. Find the area and perimeter of the square. Doesn't seem to be enough information. They haven't given any values. So what's the trick here? Well, you said of the square. What do I know of the square? I know all sides of the square are equal. So I know the two given sides are equal. So 2x plus 3 is equal to x plus 11. I solve for x. I get x is equal to 8. If x is equal to 8, what is the side of the square? Well, the side of the square is x plus 11. So x plus 11 is equal to 19. Verify. What is 2x plus 3? That's also 19. If I put x equal to 8. Now that I have the side of the square 19, I can give them the area and the perimeter. The area is 19 square and the perimeter is 4 times 19. So you see, the clever thing here was to notice that they have given a square, so the sides are equal. The area of triangle QXS is 12 units. What is the area of rectangle PQRS? I need to relate the triangle to the rectangle. How would I find the area of this triangle? So this is the triangle QXS. I need to find its area. Well, one way to find its area, and I want to involve the rectangle in some way. So I'll take QS as the base, and then what would be the height? Well, this is the base of the triangle. What's the height? Let me redraw this, this bit of the triangle. So it's something like this. Excess I'm taking as the base. What is the height? So the height is the perpendicular from the third vertex to the base. So the perpendicular, of course, to the base would be here. Or this would be the perpendicular. And that's this length. That's the length PQ or RS. So, so the perpendicular for the base excess is the length SR or RS. That's the other side of the rectangle. So the height of the triangle is the side of the rectangle. That makes life easy. So now I have area of triangle equal to half into 6 into RS, which is the height. And what do I need? I need area of rectangle. which is basically width into length. So that is PS into RS. 
So that's great. Because I know PS. PS is 16. So that's 16 into RS. So the area of the rectangle turns out to be 3 RS, which is given as 12. So RS is 4. Plug in RS 4 into the area of the rectangle and I get 16 into 4 equal to 64. So the area of the rectangle is 64 units square. The answer is D. So notice what I did. I actually just made the connection between the triangle and the rectangle. And that connection was that I kept the base excess and the height turned out to be the other dimension of the rectangle. So essentially, if you can visualize how the triangle and the rectangle are connected, the rest follows. The perimeter of rectangle PQRS is 7 by 2 times the length of side PQ. Find the ratio of PQ to QR. So this is a simple algebraic question. So let's call side PQ Y. Let's call side QR X. So what's the perimeter? The perimeter is 2y plus 2x and that's given to be 7 by 2 times the side pq which is y. So here's my equation. 2y plus 2x the perimeter is 7 by 2 times y. So let's get the y's on one side and the x's on the other. So take 2y on the other side. So that's 7 by 2y minus 2y. So 2x is equal to 3 by 2y and they want the ratio pq to qr. That means they want the ratio y to x. That's the question. So that's easy. I'll bring x on this side, I'll take 3 by 2 on that side. So I'll get 2 divided by 3 by 2 is y upon x. 2 divided by 3 by 2 is 4 upon 3. And I'm done. That's my answer. The ratio is 4 is to 3. D. The next important quadrilateral we'll study is the parallelogram. What is a parallelogram? Well, it's defined in many ways, but essentially it's a shape made up of two pairs of parallel lines. That's the easiest way to remember it. So, one pair of parallel lines and another pair of parallel lines. This part, of course, is not part of the quadrilateral. So A, B, C, D. Sides C, D and A, B are parallel and sides A, D and B, C are parallel. There are many consequences of this. If both pairs of opposite sides are parallel, that is it's a parallelogram, then many things happen. The opposite angles become equal and the opposite sides become equal in length. So AD is equal to BC and AB is equal to DC. So opposite sides become equal and opposite angles become equal. This is true of some other shapes. In a rectangle too, opposite angles are equal and opposite sides are equal. So a rectangle is a particular case of a parallelogram. So what do we know of the sides? Opposite sides are equal. What do we know about the angles? Opposite angles are equal. Let's see what else we know about the angles. So since opposite angles are equal, that means angle A is equal to angle C and angle B is equal to angle D. We also know that the sum of the angles of any quadrilateral is 360. So we know angle A plus angle B plus angle C plus angle D is equal to 360. So that's 2 angle A plus 2 angle B is equal to 360. Therefore angle A plus angle B is equal to 180 degrees. So, adjacent angles, angle A and angle B, are supplementary. That is, adjacent pairs of angles add to 180. That's a consequence of opposite angles are equal. 
Find the value of x in the parallelogram shown below. We can do it by first principles. We know that opposite angles of a parallelogram are equal. So this is x degree, this is also x, this is also 40 degrees. And just use the fact that the sum of the angles is 360. So 2x plus 80 is equal to 360. 2x is equal to 280. x is equal to 140 degrees. That's one way. The other way which we just proved was that adjacent angles are supplementary. So since x and 40 are adjacent, we get x plus 40 is 180. So x is 140 degrees. This one is by first principles. This is by the fact we just derived earlier. Area of a rectangle and a parallelogram. Well, rectangles are parallelograms, but they're special parallelograms. They're special because all the angles are 90 degrees and that makes finding their area easy. We just multiply the length and the width. How do I find the area of a parallelogram? I'll try to relate it to a rectangle. Let's take a parallelogram. And let me try to draw a rectangle that's related to this parallelogram. Well, a rectangle needs perpendicular sides. So I'll call the parallelogram A, B, C, D. And I drop a perpendicular on the side BC from A, that's at point X. This a similar thing from point B on the side BC, I call this Y. Now AX, AB, YX is my rectangle. AB, YX is a rectangle by construction. How do I relate the area of this rectangle to the area of my parallelogram? So what I'll do is, since Adjacent angles of a parallelogram are supplementary. So this angle plus this angle is 180. Therefore, this angle is equal to this angle. Angle ADX is equal to angle C. You can work that out. So since angle ADX is equal to angle C, and this is the height, this is the height, and the side opposite it is equal and AD is anyway equal to BC because opposite sides of a parallelogram are equal. We have that the two triangles, triangle ADX and triangle BCY are congruent. We have congruent triangles because they have exactly the same dimensions and the same angles. Since they are congruent triangles, I can cut out this triangle here and slot it in here. So I remove a part of the parallelogram, the part which is BCY, and I stick it on ADX. And what do I get? I end up with my rectangle. Having stuck it there, I get my rectangle ABYX. What's the area of my rectangle? Well, the area of my rectangle is area of rectangle is AB times AX. And so that must be the area of the parallelogram too, because I've removed a congruent piece and put it back on to make the rectangle. So the area of the parallelogram is proved to be AB times AX. And what has this got to do with the sides of the parallelogram? Unfortunately, it's not the product of the sides of the parallelogram. It's a product of one side, AB, and the distance between AB and its parallel side, DC. So it's the product of base and height. Area of the parallelogram is the product of its base, that is one of the parallel sides, and the height, that is the distance between that parallel side and its other parallel side. So if I call AD the base, I call AX the height. In a rectangle, since the base and the height are already perpendicular to each other, the area of the rectangle is base times height, which is length times width. 
So this is the most important construction because it gives us the reason why the area of a parallelogram requires the base and requires the distance between two parallel bases which is called the height. Find the area of the parallelogram. So we know that the area of a parallelogram is base time height. So I'll take this as the base. I'll take PQ as the base. So the other thing I need is the height. That means I need the distance between PQ and SR. So I'll take this. This is the height. How do I find this? I just use my basic trigonometric ratios. Angle S is 60 degrees. So PS, let's call this X, PSX is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. Since I've dropped it perpendicular, hypotenuse PS is given as 18. PS is 18. So if PS is 18, that SX is half of that, it's 9, and PX is 9 root 3. So the basic 30, 60, 90 triangle. So if this is 2, this is 1, this is root 3, and that's the ratio I've used. So I know PX is 9 root 3, that's the height. Now I find the area, that's P into H, that's 20 into 9 root 3. That's 180 root 3. The answer is D. In the figure, both ABCD and ABEC are parallelograms. Find the area of ABEC if the area of the entire figure is 15. So ABCD and ABEC are parallelograms. That means this is a parallelogram. And this is also a parallelogram. Two parallelograms which share a side. AB is common to both of them. And what about their heights? Well, their heights also seem to be equal. The height of the parallelogram is the distance between parallel sides. And the sides CE and the sides DC are also part of the same straight line. So the heights of the two parallelograms are also equal. So these two parallelograms have bases of equal length and heights that are equal. So they have identical areas. Let's look at any one parallelogram. Let me divide the parallelogram by a diagonal. What happens? Well, this angle is equal to this angle. This side is equal to this side. This side is equal to this side. That's true of any parallelogram. And of course, this side is common to both triangles. So the two triangles I have created are congruent. Since the two triangles I have created are congruent, they are equal in area. So each triangle is half the area of the parallelogram. So a diagonal divides the parallelogram into two triangles of equal area. So look at parallelogram ABCD. Parallelogram ABCD. So the diagonal. So this triangle. So triangles ABC and triangle ADC are equal in area. Similarly, I look at the triangle, I look at the parallelogram ABEC, I look at the parallelogram ABEC, BC is my diagonal. So triangle ABC and triangle DEC are also equal in area. So these three triangles are all equal in area. They are all equal to each other. And the area of the entire figure is 15. So since these three triangles cover the entire area, each must be 5. 5, 5, 5. Find the area of ABEC. So the parallelogram ABEC consists of two of these triangles. So the area is 5 plus 5 equal to 10 units. So I solved this question just geometrically. I didn't do any calculations till the end. I just noticed that the parallelograms are congruent. Then I divided each parallelogram into two triangles. All the triangles turned out to be congruent and life became very simple. The rhombus. 
What's a rhombus? Well, rhombus is a special kind of parallelogram. It's a parallelogram with equal sides. All four sides are equal. Not just opposite sides. It's a parallelogram with equal sides, but not necessarily equal angles. Of course, the opposite angles are equal because it is a parallelogram and that's true for any parallelogram. Diagonals of a rhombus. So let's draw a rhombus and look at its diagonals and try to deduce some properties. So that's one diagonal. And we know that any diagonal of a parallelogram divides the parallelogram into two congruent triangles and therefore triangles of equal area. So maybe I'll draw this diagonal. Well, we're noticing something, but this is a rough sketch. We're noticing that the diagonals seem to bisect each other. Well, there's more to it. Not only do they bisect each other, they bisect each other at 90 degrees. The way to prove this is to prove that all four triangles are congruent. We know that the two large adjacent triangles are congruent, but when I connect both diagonals, all four triangles are congruent. So as they meet in the center, which is 360 degrees, each angle would be 90 degrees. We know that these four sides are equal, that's given in a rhombus. So in a rhombus, the diagonals divide the rhombus into four congruent right angle triangles. And since this side is now equal to this side because the triangles are congruent, the diagonals meet at the midpoint. So they bisect each other. So diagonals do many important things. Diagonals bisect each other and they divide the triangle into four, sorry, they divide the rhombus into four congruent triangles, 90 degree triangles. That is the right angle triangles and all are congruent. Area of a rhombus using the diagonals. Okay. So, since the diagonals are bisected by each other, let's find the area of one of these triangles. So, one of these triangles, it's a 90 degree. Its base is half the diagonal. So, this is half of diagonal 1 and its height is half of diagonal 2. So what's its area? So area of one of the triangles is half into base into height. So what's the area of the entire rhombus? Well, the rhombus is made up of four of such triangles. So it's four times this area, four times half, half D1, half D2 which is half d1, d2. And that's the expression we are looking for. So area of a rhombus using the diagonals is half times the product of the diagonals. Find the area of a rhombus with side length 6 inches and one diagonal measuring 10 inches. So I draw a rhombus. I draw one diagonal. Diagonal is 10 and the sides are all 6. Okay. If I draw the other diagonal too, then I get four congruent triangles, and the important thing is the diagonals bisect each other, and each triangle is 90 degrees. So I'll draw one of these triangles. I'll draw this one. I'll draw this triangle. A O B. I know the diagonal I know that the diagonal BD was 10 so BO is 5 because the diagonals bisect each other and I know this side is 6 so this is 5 now I need to find the third side because here is my 90 degrees so the third side by Pythagoras is 6 square minus 5 square that's 36 minus 25 that's root 11 Side square is that, so side is root 11.
So AO is root 11. I need the area of the rhombus. If AO is root 11, I can find the area of one triangle and multiply it by 4. Or I can find the other diagonal. The other diagonal must be 2 root 11. Because it's bisected. So, the two diagonals are 10 and 2 root 11. And the area of the rhombus is half into 10 into 2 root 11, which is 10 root 11. Trapezoids. What are trapezoids? Well, in trapezoids, just one pair of opposite sides need be parallel. So, this is a trapezoid. But the other, so this pair of sides is parallel, but the other pair of sides, as you can see, is not parallel. Or this can be a trapezoid. This is a trapezoid, but this pair of sides is parallel, but this pair is not. So trapezoid has only one condition, well, one pair of parallel sides. What's an isosceles trapezoid? But isosceles means equal sides. So, in this kind of trapezoid, there is one pair of parallel sides. And the other pair are equal in length. So, these two sides are equal in length. So, it's a pretty symmetric figure. If I name it A, B, C, D, then A, B is parallel to C, D and AD is equal to BC. One pair of parallel sides and the other pair are equal in length. That's the area of a trapezoid, any trapezoid. So let's draw a trapezoid. Let's, let's draw the two parallel sides. I'll draw a diagonal to divide the trapezoid into triangles because basically I know how to find the area of a triangle and I use that to build up the areas of different figures. So what's the area of these two triangles? Let's give it a name A, B, C, D. I'll drop this perpendicular because to find areas of triangles I need heights. So this is height H1. And what's the height of the other triangle? If I take AB as the base, then I got to drop a perpendicular from the opposite vertex onto AB. So this is height 2. Triangle ABC has base AB and height H2. Triangle ACD has base DC and height H1. That's how I've constructed it. I've broken up my trapezoid into two triangles. Triangle ABC and triangle ACD. And I've dropped perpendiculars to get the heights of both these triangles. What can you say about these two heights? Well, it's the distance between these two parallel lines. Both the heights are the distance between the two parallel sides of the trapezoid. So the heights are equal. I know that height 1 is equal to height 2. Fine. So let's find the total area. So the area of ABC is half AB times H2. Area of ACD is half DC times H1. But H1 is equal to H2. So it's basically half AB. I'll call that common height H times H plus half DC times H. Taking out H common is half H AB plus DC. And what is AB plus DC? AB plus DC is nothing but the sum of the two parallel sides. So the area of the trapezium has a nice expression. It's half times the height times the sum of the two parallel sides. And what do I mean by the height? By the height I mean the distance between these two parallel sides. Find the area of the figure given that UR is equal to TS. So these two sides are equal. PU is equal to QR. So these two sides are equal. 
and PQ is parallel to UR is parallel to TS. That means these three horizontal lines are all parallel. So let's see what this information is actually saying. So I know that UR is equal to TS and I know that UR is parallel to TS. So I know that UR ST is a parallelogram. It has a pair of opposite sides that are both parallel and equal. So it's a parallelogram. Further PQ is parallel to UR and PU is equal to QR. So one pair of sides is parallel and the other pair of sides is equal. So PQRU is an isosceles trapezoid. Since PQ is parallel to UR and PU is equal to QR. So we have an isosceles trapezoid sitting on a parallelogram and they share a side. The side UR is common to both. We need to find the area of the given figure. So we will find the area of the trapezoid and the area of the parallelogram and add. Let's see the values given. QV is 5. TS is 8. If TS is 8, so is UR because they are parallel and equal. VR is 1. And QS is 9. So the entire thing QS is 9. I know that QV is 5. So VS will be 4. Because QS is QV plus VS. And this is 9. And this is 5. So that gives me VS is equal to 4. Since it's an isosceles trapezoid, let me drop this height as well. So this height will also be 5 because PQ and U are uh, parallel lines. And this distance, let's call this X, will also be 1 because it's a symmetric figure, the isosceles trapezoid. What's the area of an isosceles trapezoid? So the area of PQRU is half base 1 plus base 2 times the height. That's half base 1 is PQ base 2 is UR and the height is QV. Well, we know UR. UR is 8. How do I find PQ? Well, PQ is equal to XV by construction because I have dropped two perpendiculars from P and Q. And since UR is 8 and I have 1 on each side, I have a 1 here and a 1 here, XV will turn out to be 6. XV is 6. So PQ is 6. So I get half 6 plus 8 into the height, which is given as 5. QV is 5. So I get 14 into 5 into half. 7 into 5, that's 35 square units. So the area of the trapezoid is 35 square units. What about the area of the parallelogram? Well, that's easy. U R S T. We need base times height. I know the base is U R, which is 8. And I know, the, I know the height is Vs, which is 4. 8 into 4, 32. So the area of the figure is 35 plus 32, which is 67 square units. And we're done. So we just had to sift through all the information and everything fell into place. Let's move on to figures with a greater number of sides. Let's look at other polygons. So let's look at some regular polygons. What's a regular polygon? A regular polygon is a polygon with equal sides and equal angles. So a square is a regular polygon and an equilateral triangle is a regular polygon. We will look at polygons with more than four sides. A regular pentagon. So a pentagon means it has five sides. This is regular, so all sides are equal in length and all the interior angles are equal. Let's draw a regular pentagon.
So here's a regular pentagon, all sides are equal. I need to find each interior angle, which is also equal. Since it's a regular pentagon, I can find the circumcircle of this pentagon. That is the point, which will be the center of a circle, which will pass through all five vertices. Since all these distances will be the radius of that circle. Since I found this point, let's call this point O, I know that all these distances are equal. And I know that these sides are also equal in length because it's a regular pentagon. So these five triangles are congruent. So the total angle at the center is 360. So each of those angles is 360 divided by 5, which is 72 degrees. So since each of these angles is 72 degrees, now look at triangle ABO, which is one of the five triangles of the pentagon. Triangle ABO is isosceles. So this angle is equal to this angle. So 2x plus 72 is equal to 180. 2x is equal to 108. x is equal to 54 degrees. And this x that I'm referring to is half the interior angle of the pentagon. So the interior angle of the pentagon is 2x is 108 degrees. So here's a quick derivation of the fact that in a regular pentagon, each interior angle is 108 degrees. A regular hexagon. Let's look at a regular hexagon. A hexagon has six sides. So this is a regular hexagon. Extend this side a bit. Okay. In a regular hexagon, let's find out each interior angle. So again, I connect. I just connect opposite vertices and I'll get six equilateral triangles. You can prove that they're equilateral because each of these angles is 60. Since they're all equal and they add up to 360. This angle is 60 degrees. These two sides are equal. So each of these angles is equal and they are 60 each. So in a regular hexagon, we can divide the figure into six equilateral triangles. That makes finding the area of the regular hexagon also easy. Because if I just know the side of a regular hexagon, I can find its area. That's true of any regular polygon. If I know the side because of the symmetry and using trigonometry, I can find out the area. Let's look at a typical question. The perimeter of a regular hexagon is 72 feet. Find the area. So the perimeter is 72. So the sum of the six sides is 72. So each side is 72 by 6. That's 12 feet. Each side is 12 feet. I look at one of those six equilateral triangles that I've created. And I'll find its area. Once I have the area of one of the six equilateral triangles, I can get the area of the entire hexagon. So it's the area of an equilateral triangle. It's root 3 by 4 side square. So it's the area of the regular hexagon. It's 6 root 3 by 4 side square. So in this case it will be 6 into root 3 divided by 4 times 12 squared. I get 12 into 3. I divide the 4 into one of the 12s. So I get 12 into 3. So 12 into 3 is 36. 36 into 6 is 216. 216 root 3 feet square. That's the area of the regular hexagon. Well, looks like all these answer choices are wrong. The answer is 216 root 3 feet square. Okay, so we are done with basic questions on 
quadrilaterals and polygons. Remember that in many of these cases, all you need to do is reduce the shape to that of triangles and then life becomes easy because we have total control over the triangle. In the next lesson, we will look at circles.